I'm a big believer in augmented reality in sports. I know there's a lot of talk about virtual reality in sports and how you can have a bit more immersive experience. Um, I would love to be able to hold up my phone uh, at, over a basketball court and have you know those stats over top of players' names. Hi, my name is Robert Schmidt, also known as Mr. IoT. Uh, I'm Deloitte's chief IoT technologist, and my passion is for all things digital. Today on my show, Coffee with Mr. IoT, I have Pete Giorgio. Welcome, Pete. Thanks, welcome. Thanks for I'm having me. Excited to be here. That's awesome. Pete, you're leading our sports practice. Mm -hmm. um, Sports and Deloitte, how does that fit together? It, it is a funny sort of, it's a, it's a funny mix. Although actually, it's, it, we've been working in sports for a long time. Uh, traditionally on the, the sort of tax and audit side of things, but uh, you know, we've done a bunch of different stuff in the space and especially as you know, the sports industry is starting to see a lot of the sort of change and transformation we've seen in other industries, uh, there's lots more opportunity to do some really interesting stuff in the space. So tell us some of the stuff you do, yeah. you work in. So my practice uh, focuses primarily on teams, uh, leagues, some of the big leagues, uh, a lot of the what we call national governing bodies. So the U.S. Golf Association, U.S. Tennis Association, organizations like that. Um, and we do everything from uh, strategy work, so helping them think about how do we uh, create new revenue streams, how do we uh, achieve some of the goals that we have, things like that. Uh, we do a lot of technology work, uh, so a lot of either hardcore or sort of back-end technology work or other things too. Uh, we even do leadership, organization work. It's kind of across the gamut, across all these different groups. So, You talked about technology. Yeah. Um, we'll get into the Internet of Things in a little bit, but how has technology changed sports in your mind? Yeah, it, um, you know, I actually think one of the really interesting things um, that it has allowed sports organizations to do is they've, they've always talked about their fans, right? So you've always said, I'm a fan of this, I'm a fan of that, we have X million fans of our organization. And if you ask them who they are, they, uh, you know, they, they don't really understand who those people are. It, it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, if you go to a, an event, uh, there's very little chance that the organization that puts on that event, this team, the league, knows that you're there. Right, so think about it. Your friend calls you up and says, hey, I got three tickets to the game tonight, you wanna to come? Right? They have no idea that you're in the, in the stands. And so I think one of the really cool things is how technology is allowing organizations to build relationships with these folks, to even know who they are in the first place, to build relationships, to make connections with those individuals in a way that hasn't been possible before. Um, and, it, and it's interesting uh, across the board too, because it's not just uh, all about making money too. Uh, we do a lot of work with these national governing bodies who at the end of the day money is a good uh, vehicle for them to achieve their mission but ultimately they're trying to get more people to play tennis, more people to play golf, things like that too. And technology is allowing to make those connections too. Not just for a, on a sort of revenue or profit basis but as to get people to sort of engage in these sports. And so it's, it's really cool as, the, as things have evolved from the business side. And then also, I mean, I'm sure we get to this, but also just literally from the sport performance side, you know, technology is making huge gains in terms of how athletes train, how they think about training, how they think about recovery, how they collect information about what they're doing, how they relay that information to fans to engage them better in what they're trying to do too. So it's fascinating. You know, <laughs> Where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, you know, my head is spinning. I have like five different things yeah, I want to go into. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to start with you, actually. So in order to lead the sports practice, do you have to be a uh, professional athlete? Have you been a professional <laughs> athlete? And sort of like next question to that yeah. is, what's the sport you personally still love sure, going yeah, yeah, to yeah, and yeah. doing? Uh, I am not a professional athlete. I never have been a professional athlete. I did, I did play. So I was a basketball player. So I was always tall and I was a basketball player. Uh, although, funnily enough, I, um, I didn't start playing until late. I started playing when I was a junior in high school, and I, I still to this day think the only reason the coach let me play was I was the only person on the team he didn't have to worry about getting kicked off for grades. <laughs> right? so, uh, so I played in college, and, and I still play, actually, I, even though I probably shouldn't. Uh, and these knees uh, can only handle it every once in a while, I still play. But you know, now I play a lot more uh, less impactful sports. I play a lot more golf, things like that nice. too. So, but it's always been a part of who I am and what I do and how I talk about it. I still coach a lot, things like that too. But it's, it's really, 
Basketball is, is the game I like to play, golf more and more. Um, although American football is actually what I like to watch. Uh, I, I don't, there's very few things I enjoy more than watching an American football game. So, so you talked about uh, how technology has impacted the sport mm -hmm. uh, and athletes' performance yeah. and really improved. Do you have a great story to tell around that that uh, you can share with us? You know, I, I think the interesting thing about it for me is, is not just that it exists and it's been around for a while. Um, uh, it, it's also that it is starting to become part of how we engage as fans with sports too, right? So uh, think about the World Cup, right, and the, watching it on TV and all the stats that you see now about how far the you know, the, the, the football players, right? The football <laughs> players or the soccer players here in the US, how far they run, how long they've been out there, some of those things. Um, we're having some interesting conversations with teams who are doing some really cool stuff uh, with technology and data and analytics on injury prevention, mm -hmm. right? How do you really understand when an athlete is at a higher risk for injury uh, and pull them out either of a practice or a game or, or, or adjust what you do in practice in a game? Um, all the way through, I was actually a fascinating conversation uh, with somebody in the Olympic movement recently around, uh, specifically around IoT and technology, you'll love this one. They, um, they need to find somebody who can put a sensor on the end of a diving board, right? So that the, today what they do is they do a lot of video analysis because mm -hmm. when you're diving, it's a lot about how much depression you get of the board and how much spring you get and, and actually the, the, the resonance of the board. Uh, and, and timing and things like that too. Um, and they're figuring out how they can actually put a device on the board to, to measure how much the, the actual flex of the board happens and how different people do different things based on what they're trying to do. And not just the up and down flex, but there is, depending on what you're trying to do, you may want to be going left and right as well in terms of getting the right type of spin and things like that. So how can they use information like that that traditionally a coach would have to watch and say, listen, you're leaning too far to the left, you're leaning too far to the right. Um, you know, how does that work? Um, my favorite one though is I, um, I spent, so golf, I'm new, a new golfer. I've been playing really for four or five years. Uh, do you play? I haven't played in okay, a while. The technology that is available to you and I to help us with our golf swing is astounding. The video analysis, the things that they do, uh, they literally have pressure plates in the floor to measure your weight transfer, um, all those things now that honestly 10 years ago were only available to professional athletes. You and I can walk into a place mm -hmm. down the road now and get on a daily basis. And so. Yeah, IoT is really actually the way how sense has gotten so cheap, right? It's yeah. becoming really accessible to everybody to train and be as uh, well-informed as athletes are. Yeah, yeah. I was actually walking on the CES floor and there was uh, a guy walking with a ski and it, it was a French ski so I thought he must speak German which he didn't yeah. but he had a little <laughs> tag on there and he told me that he measures movement of skis and he can actually tell people within two hours how to become better skiers yeah, yeah. because of those uh, I was, I was reading about. recently about there's a, yeah, there's, there's a set of skis and you have earphones and there's, they actually beep and have different sounds based on how you're turning, so you can literally adjust as you go, right? Um, so so I, I think it's really interesting that the professional side, and, and, and we've been doing that for a while, but the fact that you and I can now participate in these things and it can help you and I with, with what we're trying to do is amazing. So I'm curious, you talked about athletes and you talked about how it helps athletes be healthier. Um, two questions on this. First yeah. of all, have we seen enough data over time to actually show that improvement? And secondly, um, how does this relate to the privacy of health data? Mm. Right? There's sort of a really interesting kind yeah. of divergence, right? Because in a way, I want to stay healthy. Yeah, but is yeah, this yeah, what yeah. data? How competitive is the data? How yeah. shareable and yeah. so forth? What What do sports teams do nowadays about this? What goes on? Yeah. There? Um, so I think they are definitely. So I, you know, I think there's always your question around lo the longitudinal nature of the data and how long do you need to have it. I think there definitely are learnings and there definitely are things that. That, that teams and athletes and trainers and folks like that are learning from the data. Obviously, every month that goes by when you have more data, it gets better, right? Uh, you get more data, you get different types of data, the data is more accurate, you learn what to look for, create, you know, baselines, establish baselines for things like that. So it is getting better, um, and I think it will continue to do so, especially with, like you said, the proliferation of sensors and and, and how easy it is to, to do some of these things too. Uh, the data privacy is a, is a really interesting question. Um, and in the sports world, actually, 
it, it has you know privacy uh, implications, but there are actually real financial implications that, that sort of happen with in, in the data world as well. Um, every single one of the professional leagues in the United States right now is trying to figure out who owns that data about their athletes and what can they do with it, right? So on the one hand, they can use the data to help the athletes perform better and do better, extend their careers, things like that. On the other hand, the athletes are saying, well, yeah, but you know, they could use that data against me in contract negotiations. That data is valuable. How am I going to get compensated for that data? Um, and more and more as gambling becomes a part of, of sports in the U.S., that data becomes really interesting uh, you know, to folks who have wagers on games and things like that, too. So I don't know exactly how it's all going to uh, uh, flesh out, but it's going to be really interesting to sort of see where and how it does. Um, a lot of the leagues, I know, understand this is an issue. Uh, it ends up being an interesting negotiation issue between the players' associations and the leagues, and all of them are trying to tackle it right now. I don't think anyone's really figured it out yet, uh, but all of them are trying to do something. So I want to switch topics. Yeah. I want to go from the sport to the place the sport takes yeah, yeah, place. Yeah. Um, what are we doing in terms of really creating event places that are just much more exciting than they've been in the past? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, there, it's interesting. There are stadiums in this country uh, that physically, because of the material that the stadium was built and how it was constructed, it's very hard to get pervasive uh, antennas that really will cover the stadium. Not really an issue for a lot of this, certainly any stadiums that's built in the past five years, but some of these stadiums that have been around, actually in Europe, it's a huge problem. Some of those stadiums in the UK that have been around for 100 years, you know, it just, it literally doesn't work, so. Um, but, uh, you know, more, as more and more stadiums get built, as more and more stadiums get renovated, you're seeing more and more how that type of connectivity can come, become pervasive. Uh, and I think teams are starting to uh, understand and do a better job of how they use it, although I think they're still just scratching the surface. Um, you know, they're really trying to, the, the, the panacea, the thing that, that all of them are trying to get to is how do they create for you and I a seamless experience? And a seamless experience, not just in the stadium, but from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go home at night, right? How do you, how do you seamless experience for a plan for it? Uh, most people's worst part of going to a game is getting there. Getting there, finding a parking space, finding their seat, right? That's, I mean, that's usually one of the biggest issues. Uh, and that's a hard one because if you think about technology and how it solves that, you have to answer questions like how does ride sharing affect that? So it's, it's literally not just wires and electrons. It's, it's business models. It's, you know, how do all these things come together? Um, and so, you know, teams are trying to tackle these things. It'll, it'll happen slowly for some of those things because they're stadiums that just weren't built, you know, with ride share as, as, as an option. The stadiums just like with, with Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, but what you're going to see is, is we are being taught on a daily basis to expect a seamless experience, right? Uh, you, it would be inconceivable to me 30 years ago, and you probably talk about this all the time, that I could decide to watch a movie, go click a button, and go watch it, right? Just, you know, but that type of accessibility, that type of seamless experience is what we expect, and it's why we get frustrated at stadiums, because I still have to stand in line for snacks. I get to the front, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not gonna, I gotta get back to my seat, and I miss these things, and it, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things about that experience. And so teams are doing everything from, you know, certainly, some of the baseline, basic stuff, in-seat ordering, um, different things like that too. But, but doing interesting things like uh, using cameras um, to actually track traffic flow in the stadium to understand where are the lines for bathrooms? Where, where, where are the places where um, there is a lot of congestion? Where are the places if, if, if you need to go, want to get a hot dog, right? Where's the quickest place for you to get a hot dog right now? Um, and, and all of those things. And so we're seeing folks dig into those and understand those. And that's even before we start thinking about how you and I want to use that connectivity in the stadium to post to Facebook, you know, post to Instagram, collect videos, connect with friends, you know, have all of those different experiences as well. So. It's almost like if when we talk about this, I'm reminded how a stadium is sort of similar to the needs that an airport has. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, or a hotel. You know, or, or a hotel, yeah. many public spaces where yeah. you just want to get a mall. Mm -hmm. How do I get 
the fastest to the place I want to go, what can I do on the way there, yeah. and how can I connect with people around me. Yeah. And so it's very similar in that sense. What do you find in your travel and when you meet, what's your favorite place today to go to that's really gotten the closest to what you'd like? And it doesn't have to be a stadium, though it could be. I'm not really... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's funny because my favorite stadium is Fenway Park in Boston. Okay. And a lot of it has to do with... You don't have to be from Boston, do you? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to be honest, a lot of it has to do with a lot of these things haven't happened there. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so there is a sort of old school charm to the place. You're still standing in line for your hot dog. And yeah, chat well, yeah, and, and everything's cramped room. and you okay. know, the people could bringing stuff up and down the aisles. Atmosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Um, uh, but that's a that's a little bit more nostalgic, you know. I, I you know it's funny. Um, every new venue that goes up gets better at this, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as folks are understanding how to do this, as, as as teams understand what the investment it takes and things like that, every single one of them, it's hard to pick out a particular one. Um, it's hard to pick out a particular one, but okay. it, it's encouraging to me that 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 that. It's encouraging to me that, that teams are understanding how much you and I really want this and desire this and need this in our experience and that they're really working so hard to actually put it in their venues. Um, so I think we're going to see steady improvement there. So one of the things I, I asked you about the connectivity because, um, you know, you pinged me on football, right? Yeah. And one of the things that fascinates me about some of the sports that I watch, there's so much downtime in yeah. between the action, right? Yeah, yeah. And so what do people do when they're downtime? They pick up the phone, yeah. right? And then you know, have connectivity. Yeah. And so uh, what are we seeing around engaging people and keeping them engaged with the sport? Yeah. Because I would expect that lots of the, st I would love to see more stats on my phone. I'd yeah. like to, not stats what they did the last 10 years, stats of the last 10 minutes, how fast they ran yeah. and so forth. Yeah. I just uh, saw how the Kings and the Oilers had a yeah. glowing buck on, puck yeah. on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's awesome stuff. Are we going to see more of this? Where, where do we see yeah. the digital transformation happening there? Yeah, no, I, I think we will see more and more of, the, of these types of things. I, I'm a big believer in augmented reality in sports. I, I know there's a lot of talk about virtual reality in sports and how you can have a bit more immersive experience. Um, I would love to be able to hold up my phone uh, at, over a basketball court and have you know those stats over top of players' names. I, I would love... I would love to go to a golf event. Have you ever been to a golf event, a live golf yeah, event? Yeah, I have. You, how much time do you spend saying, hey, who is that? Who is that over there? Exactly. <laughs> Wait, what club are they? Have they hit the ball yet? Wait, do they hit? And then all of a sudden, thump, you hear over here, <laughs> and the ball is landing. And to be able to just hold up your phone and yeah. find out that information. So I think, I think folks will start to uh, crack that nut, and they're starting to do that in golf a little bit. Um, so I think that'll be fascinating um, as that starts to enter the realm um, as well. But I, you know, I, I do think these things will they'll, they'll take some time. Um, but but I think we'll see them more and more as as we move forward. So. Do you think there's a fear of, you talked about augmented reality, right? Which I totally get that. That's sort of like what you do there, you overlay yeah. it. Virtual reality, a whole different ball game. Do you mm -hmm. think VR is going to compete with the stadium experience or will it never? Um, I hope it does. Okay. Yeah, I hope it does. I mean, I, I, um, I, I'm a believer. It, it's funny, folks talk a lot about uh, millennials and their relationships with sporting events. And, um, and how millennials are going to want to, you know, they just want to sit at home on the couch. My experience with millennials is they love going someplace and having a shared experience with 40,000 other people. Actually, more than my, my parents do, right? Mm -hmm. My parents, well, they get mad when everyone's talking during a game and not, not <laughs> focusing on it, right? Um, I, I think the day when, when, when you can sit here uh, in Vegas and and put on a headset and sit next to your buddy who lives in Australia and both of you sit at the 50 you know at the at the the center line of a Manchester United game and talk to each other just like you were sitting there I, you know I think that's actually gonna be great for sports I think it's gonna change things right I think it's gonna completely change what that live experience is and what it could be and 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 I know I, you know I'm not sure what'll happen with stadiums and things like that but the, the, the your ability to do that it will only help things right and and that that now I think that's going to be I mean you probably know more than I do about how far away that is but they're playing with that already so, you so just, now, the only thing is the only thing is you've got to figure out how to do a high five right how do you <laughs> high five your, your buddy in Australia right so yeah that's fine I love that 
So we're almost at the end of our coffee chat, and yeah. I want to close with a hypothetical question. Sure. Um, so you're going to retire at some point in time. What team are you going to buy? <laughs> if I could buy one. I, you know, it's funny. I, I, um, I would love to find a small football team in Europe. Right, a, a level. So a soccer team, team, or you mean a football team no, that plays American team. football? Soccer oh, a soccer team. team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or in the U.S., a AAA baseball team. There's something about that sort of small market, uh, uh, creative outlet, um, you, you go for broke type of thing that I think is awesome. fascinating in this world. So I'd, I'd be excited about that. I'm not sure which one. I have to figure out which country it would be in first, but uh, that's awesome. But it'd be awesome. So you are you in? I'm in. Yeah, all right. Um, good. I mean, for the football, though, they're going to all laugh at me because I'm a hockey guy, so I play okay. hockey. Gotcha. Think, but, so you know. we, can find a, we can find a, a hockey team, too. We'll do a couple. That's awesome. There I love go. that. We diversify. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the coffee chat is coming to an end. Um, Pete, great. thank you so much for doing this with us. My pleasure. And Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And if you missed any part of today's coffee chat, uh, please come and check out my YouTube channel, and you can see there today's show or any past shows. And with that, have a good one. Thanks. Bye.